Dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this webinar with the title Protect, Restore and Sustainably Use for Forests, Building Blocks for Environmental and Economic Recovery, organized by the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, on behalf of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests. My name is Alexander Buck, and I'm the Executive Director of IUFRO, the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. And for the next 75 minutes or so, I'm going to be your moderator and guide you through the webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be. It's really great that you have uh, decided to join this webinar to coincide with the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, as I think you will agree with me, forests and sustainable forestry can indeed help the world recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and combat looming environmental crises such as climatic changes and biodiversity loss. However, uh, this requires society to better recognize the considerable value of forests and their crucial roles in building inclusive, resilient and sustainable economies. Important commitments regarding the world's forests have been made at a variety of international fora, such as the United Nations Food Systems Summit, um, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change um, that recently held its COP26, the United Nations Environmental Assembly 5.2, or the United Nations Forum on Forests, which recently met for its 17th session. But I should also like to mention the even more recent uh, um, important documents adopted at the FAO World Forestry Congress 2022, including the sole uh, forest declaration and the ministerial call on the sustainable wood adopted at this World Forestry Congress. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the state of the world's forest 2022 published by the FAO uh, provides three pathways to implement this new perspective of making development work with the environment. Uh, protect, these are measures to halt deforestation, restore, meaning uh, to make land more productive and use, denoting investments in building economically viable green value chains that provide resilient livelihoods. Um, today's event will look at the interfaces between the three pathways, protection, restoration, and the sustainable use of forests. Um, the program of the webinar will be as follows. First, we will hear opening remarks by FAO's Deputy Director General, Ms. Maria Helena Semedo. Uh, then the president of my own organization, uh, UFRO, uh, uh, Dr. John Perotta, will set the scene for us uh, diving into the three building blocks. Our panel, and I will introduce our distinguished panelists in a moment, we look into how these building blocks can simultaneously conserve nature, better provide for human well-being, and contribute to inclusive recovery that builds resilient and sustainable economies. After the panel, we will, it will be your turn and we will have some time for exchange with the participants where our panelists will be happy to answer your questions. And already now, I would kindly ask you to use the Q&A function of this webinar for posting your paid questions uh, to the panel. So please feel, feel free to post your questions using that Q&A function. Uh, towards the end of the webinar, Ms. Mare Atala, who is the coordinator for Nature for the Climate Branch from the United Nations Environment Program, we close the event reflecting on how to build forward through investing in forest-based solutions. And needless to say, we hope that the event will provide insights on the environmental and economic recovery potential in view of contributing to forthcoming international discussions. Ladies and gentlemen, now without any further delay, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Ms. Maria Helena Semedo for her opening remarks. Actually, I believe Ms. Semedo needs no introduction. Nevertheless, I would like to say that she's the Deputy Director General of the FAO, and in that role leads major parts of FAO's work, ranging from transforming food systems to dealing with climate change, including the work of the Forestry Division. Ms. Semedo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexander, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Dear participants, friends, happy to see some of you on the screen after uh, Seoul. And uh, very 
also happy to join this event today as uh, we are starting the Stockholm Plus 50. Uh, in 1992, 1972, the world came together for the first United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. Yet today, as we look back on 50 years on global environment action, the world still faces huge challenges. We have to overcome the social and economic consequences of COVID-19, aggravated by conflicts and face the climate crisis. We need solutions that can be applied at scale, that are cost effective and equitable, and that can be implemented rapidly in an inclusive manner. Forests and trees provide powerful solutions. They are a source of sustainable livelihoods, prosperity and resilience for both people and the environment. If you use them more wisely, we can address both pressing environmental issues and economic recovery needs. We have seen some progress on forests since 1972, but it's not enough. We lose fewer forests per year than two decades ago, but it's still too much. We have more forests under protection than before, but still too little. At the same time, our population continues to grow. More people need more materials, most of which are neither renewable nor sustainably produced. The recently launched State of the World Forests 2022 provides three mutually reinforcing pathways to implement a new perspective to achieve sustainable, healthy forests to help build inclusive and sustainable economies. As it has already mentioned during this, the opening, we have three main messages. One, protect, halting deforestation to help stop climate change and biodiversity loss, including through increasing agriculture productivity on existing agriculture land. Two, restore, making land more productive through planting or agroforestry. And three, use, for example, by using wood more wisely, by building higher value added cha value chains that provide resilient livelihoods and build carbon neutral local economies. We need to ensure forest protection, restoration and sustainable use, help reinforce a wider agri-food system transformation. This is also a message that was echoed at the recently concluded World Forestry Congress, which underlined that the time to act is now to build a green, healthy, and resilient future with forests. FAO is committed to support members in upscaling efforts to build forward better and greener towards more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable agri-food system. We do this, for example, in the context of Red Plus program, where we are working across agri-food system to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, an essential part of the global efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change. FAO colleagues, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration with the United Nations Environment Program. The aim to restore 350 million hectares of degraded land between now and 2030 could generate three, nine trillion US dollars in ecosystem services and lay the basis for jobs and income from more productive land. The EU FAO flat program has supported 40 tropical timber producing countries to improve forest governance and support legal timber trade. 
This is a critical component to build legal and sustainable value chains and market based on wood. As a renewable and carbon neutral high value material, sustainable wood offers solutions across multiple value chains, including construction, packaging, renewable energy, biomaterials for clothing and biochemicals. FAO looks forward to Stockholm Plus 50 to further strengthen how we can make development work with the environment and to take these ideas forward at the upcoming committee on forestry. I look forward to today's exchange to see how protection, restoration, and sustainable use of forests can be scaled up as building blocks for a green recovery and for carbon neutral and resilient economy. I wish you a fruitful meeting and thank you for your attention. Over to you, Alexander. Thank you so much, Maria Helena, for your very insightful remarks on the three building blocks and especially also pro providing these very compelling examples of really how forests can contribute to uh, actually building more environmental and economic resilience and recovery. That is very much appreciated. Thank you so much, Maria Helena. And Maria Helena has mentioned both uh, the SOFO report and participants, you can find the link to the report in the chat box. She has also mentioned the important outcome documents of the recently held World Forestry Congress, and you can also find a link to those documents in the chat box. The SOFO has already been mentioned, the State of the World's Forest Report, and I'd suggest that uh, before we dive deeper into today's discussions, let us uh, watch a short video about the COFO. The SOFO, sorry. Forests stand as a vital defense against climate change and biodiversity loss while also providing livelihoods for millions of people around the world. But they are under threat. In the last 30 years, they've lost an area larger than Algeria and Libya combined. FAO's latest State of the World's Forest Report identifies three pathways that conserve forests while supporting recovery. Halting deforestation, restoring degraded forests, and sustainably using forests to build resilient local economies. In Kenya's Kerisia Forest, the local community has a new mission of preservation, having recently taken custody of the forest after decades of government control. They now go on patrol to look out for wildfires or any illegal harvesting or cattle grazing. Since 2016, more than 100 square kilometers of forest have rebounded from deforestation and degradation. And there's massive restoration and regeneration happening. And uh, the process of restoring that forest through engaging of community scouts on protecting of natural regeneration. Pamela Linolganja and her fellow Samburu women nurture a nursery of seedlings for future forest planting. Across Kenya, forest-based value chains are emerging and contribute to restoration efforts. Ruth Waiiremu gathers firewood from dead branches on two and a half hectares of her farmland that she set aside for a tree plantation. She will begin selling timber in a few years once the trees have grown larger. Their timber helps generate jobs across the community, from sawmill operators who process the wood to carpenters next door who craft tables, chairs, beds, and more. In Finland, wood construction chains are thriving based on sustainable forest management. Innovative building materials from wood are helping to respond to climate change and the need to build more circular economies. These prefabricated wood panels are called cross-laminated timber, or CLT. They're as durable as concrete, but faster and simpler to install, store carbon for their lifetime, and require no fossil-based materials, making them more climate-friendly. 
CLT made here forms the building blocks for schools, apartments, opera houses, and even skyscrapers across the world. Tangible benefits, whether environmental or economic, offer a strong incentive for societies to protect, restore, and responsibly use their forest resources, preserving the value of forests for generations to come. Metsien kestävällä hoidolla me pystytään varmistamaan metsien hyvä kunto sitten myös tulevaisuudessa. Yeah, so with this video we have already actually seen some really nice examples of the many benefits provided by forests if, uh, to use uh, Mr. Meadows' words, we use them wisely. And we will hear more examples in the course of this webinar from our panelists. But before we go to the panelists, please let me give the floor to John Perotta. Uh, Dr. John Perotta is the program leader for international science issues at the United States Forest Service, and also the president of the International Union of Forest Research Organizations, IUFRO. John will be setting the scene for us and elaborate further on the three building blocks, the protection, the restoration, and the sustainable use of forests. John, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Alexander, for your kind introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be participating in this event today. And in the brief time I have available, I'd like to actually pick up where Maria Helena left off and provide what I see um, as some of the, the obstacles that we're, we're facing at, at the, um, in, in, in restoring, sustainably using, and, and conserving our forests. Um, as we know, the protection, restoration, and sustainable use of forests and their biodiversity is critical to the health of our planet and our global society. Forests, woodlands, and trees outside of forests provide a wide range of goods, as well as environmental, social and economic services of varying, of varying importance and value to a broad range of st stakeholders over, diff over differing time scales. Some are very near term, some relate to the benefits bequeathed to future generations. For example, forests in many parts of the world support food security and nutrition, are critical sources of clean water. They help to mitigate and adapt to climate change and provide livelihoods and support economies and cultures of communities worldwide. But despite their well-documented importance to people and our future, forests continue to be lost or degraded in many parts of the world. And those who depend on them most directly are the first to suffer as a result. Clearly, the central role of forests in supporting life on this planet is not adequately valued by many governments and others whose investments in land management activities in other sectors currently drive deforestation and forest degradation. There are a number of reasons for this failure, but I would like to highlight just a couple which have emerged from many decades of scientific research and even longer experience. In many parts of the world, forest loss and degradation are closely linked to governance failures and lack of policy coordination among sectors. Even, when the, even where there are seemingly adequate policies, related to forest conservation and forest management, the legal, regulatory, legal and regulatory frameworks and institutions related to forests are often very weak. This creates openings for more politically and financially powerful actors to pursue short-term profits for themselves at the expense of long-range benefits for the broader public, very often usurping the rights of those less powerful, including those of indigenous peoples and local communities in the process. The results of this are often painfully obvious, including severe over-exploitation of forest resources, land degradation, and impoverishment of those who have been the stewards of, of these lands for generations. Lack of policy coordination with respect to forests is all too common. In most countries, ministries or other government agencies responsible for forests um, as well as nature conservation, are typically in a weak bargaining position when dealing with their counterparts in other land management sectors, as well as in the energy, mining, transportation, and urban sectors. This frequently results in marginalization of forests and, and forest-dependent communities, conversion of forests, 
mostly to agriculture, and lack of investments in conservation, sustainable management, and restoration of degraded forest landscapes, as well as investments in education, extension services, and development of value addition and marketing infrastructure for forest products, all of which are needed for a sustainable forest-based economy. But in spite of these limitations related to governance and policy coordination, uh, there is a lot of good work and progress being made. And I'm sure we'll hear uh, some good example of this from our panelists today. We are also seeing some progress at the global level. For example, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development provides an important framework for policy coordination and planning at the national level, recognizing the interdependencies among sustainable development goals. And if I may, I'd like to share a screen because um, Yes. Thank you for your patience. Um, in, in coordinating action and, and harmonizing policies uh, necessary for achievement of the sustainable development goals, um, governments need, they need help. They need, they need the tools and information and knowledge um, to, to make, to make uh, sensible decisions about how best to harmonize the various goals. Um, one of these, one of the tools that's, um, that's I think of, of great importance is national, uh, natural and social capital accounting. This is an approach being explored by many governments uh, as a tool for intersectoral policy coordination and planning uh, to ensure the long-term values and services provided by forests, as well as other natural and managed ecosystems is maintained while pursuing shorter range development goals. Developed through interdisciplinary research led by environmental economists over the past 20 years, it recognizes the relationships among environmental, social, and economic components of sustainable development and the importance of government governance institutions in harmonizing and, and uh, development um, objectives. Approaches such as this can help us to reposition for us a significant component of the natural capital in most countries of the world into a more central position in, in, in the policy and planning activities of, of governments. Um, I, I realize that I have limited time to speak and I could go on quite a bit about this and other topics, um, but I think I can wrap it up here and thank everyone for their, um, for their attention. And I look forward to, to hearing our panelists and the discussion following that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, for setting the scene for our discussions so well and for this important reminder that indeed the role of forests in supporting life on land continues to be um, undervalued. But also thank you for uh, you know elaborating on the underlying reasons, but also on the ways on how to overcome this problem. And as you mentioned, I think the, the panelists later on will give us some other additional examples of how really this potential forest can be utilized more appropriately. So thank you again very much, John, and you will join us again later on for the Q&A part of this webinar. Thank you. And I can see from the chat that we do indeed also have uh, participants from all around the globe, who I already now also want to encourage later on to take the floor to post questions in the, uh, in the, in the Q&A session so that they can be addressed by our panelists later on. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let us now move to our discussion uh, on the interface between protection, restoration and sustainable use. We are going to hear a number of country cases and each of the country cases that are going to be presented aim at linking two of these three building blocks in order to achieve more impact. And I'm very pleased to introduce our first panelist for this webinar, uh, Johan Ekeström, uh, he's with us today. Johan recently joined uh, Buraufa Agroforestry in Laos as, the, as its CEO. Johan has previously been working with equipment and software for the agricultural market at the Swedish company Munters and has been a management consultant at McKinsey and Company. So hello, Johan. And Johan, if you allow me, I will uh, uh, straight away uh, uh, ask the following question. Um, and the question would be as follows. Restoration involving trees can provide large environmental, social, and economic benefits. Globally, 2.2 billion hectares of degraded land have been identified as potentially being available for restoration. 
Numerous studies have demonstrated the higher productivity of agroforestry systems and the improved resilience. Yet, uh, I feel that many farmers perceive them as being less productive and thus uh, financially more risky. So, Johan, in your experience, how can uh, restoration and sustainable use be linked in practice to assure productivity and income? So what can you tell us about this question based on your experience in Lao and, of course, based also on your previous experience in your previous roles? Thank you, Alexander, for a very interesting question. And, and hello, everyone. Yes, so I'm, I'm representing Budapa, uh, an agroforestry company in Laos. And what we are trying to do is to, to use degraded land in, in a better way. And you doing this in an ethical and, and sustainable manner. So all the time, I mean, this is the, the, the end means here is, is to having a profitable company. But we believe that in order to do this, we have to, to get all these building blocks in place. And what we do in Laos is that we use an agroforestry model where we plant trees on, on degraded land. Um, and the trees are later used for, for plywood production. Um, and the planting of the trees is done in close cooperation with the local villagers and, and farmers. So um, they do clearing of the land from bamboo, for example, weeding, planting of the small seedlings. And all of this work is offered to, to people living in the area. And I think from our experience, this is maybe the most important part that to be able to offer a stable income to the people in the area, um, we believe that that is the foundation to, to, to be able to, to protect forests around the area, uh, but also to be able to, to plant more in, in, the, in the, of the degraded land. And local farmers normally increase their, their income per hectare with roughly three times uh, compared to what they did uh, before working with, with Burapa. And I think the other part is that we are working with a model where we offer the farmers to, to um, put crops on um, during the first year when we plant trees. So then the um, very often upland uh, rice. Um, and this is good because it, it's this every seventh year they give them the opportunity to plant on that land, which means that, that they don't need to look for other land to plant rice because the seven year cycle mimics quite well how they used to, to plant. Um, then they, every seventh year they go to, to that uh, slot. And I think that is also a key of that, that trying to keep it simple and, and mimic what's already there uh, as much as, uh, as possible. Um, and I also think that, that having a model like this, making people to see that it's possible to make money from, from planting trees, create a lot of interest in the communities and, and so on. And there, I think it's important then to offer the support for those interested farmers, outgrower programs, which could include training, how to grow trees, but also to, to give them access to, for example, seedlings of high quality that they can use for, uh, for the potential. So to help them to, to, to take that step and, and, uh, and get to, to action. And if there, there's one final thing about what I think in, in order for us at least to, to get a successful agroforestry model, which is both profitable, but, but also do good for uh, in other aspects, is to get the, the different stakeholders' interests aligned. And it sounds very, I mean, it, it's, it's easy to say, but I think it's, it's, it's difficult to do. But I think what, what we have, have been able to do here in Laos is that we do get great job opportunities for local farmers. We are helping the, the country to build up a, a new industry uh, using all these degraded land. So we get the full support from, from, the, uh, from the government, as well as, as running an, a company, uh, a profitable company. 
Yeah, Johan, thank you so much for sharing this really fascinating example from Laos. Um, I think you, you mentioned a number of uh, really important factors to keep in mind when going about agroforestry uh, concepts and approaches. And um, I'm really impressed by, you know, by what you've told us. And, um, and I hope that, you know, later on, we will also hear in the discussion, perhaps also some reflections by participants. Thank you so very much for this important contribution, Johan. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now move to another continent, to Europe. Um, we do have uh, with us Mr. Petri Heno as our next panelist. Mr. Heno is a forester by profession and has worked many years in the promotion of Finnish wood construction, lobbying for organizations such as the Finnish Timber Council and the Finnish Forest Industries Federation. He was also engaged in projects for the Nordic Timber Council. Uh, Petri Heno then worked as a research manager at the Kiemen Lasko University of Applied Sciences for four years. And the focus of the research and development was on interior design solutions with wood. Uh, Mr. Heno is currently, and he has been doing that since 2016, responsible for the National Wood Building Program at the Ministry of the Environment of Finland. And this is also what he's going to talk about uh, today in his panel statement. Uh, recently, Mr. Heno has also acted as the initiator of the European Wood Policy Platform, the goal of which is to help public officials uh, in defining the measures for the increased use of wood in their respective countries. Uh, and Mr. Heno, my question to you would be the following. Um, the annual global consumption of all natural resources combined is expected to more than double to 190 billion tons by 2060, so in less than 40 years from now. Yet again, today only 25%, so one quarter of the total material demand today is met by biomass, and the remainder is being met by non-renewable resources. So that is quite a formidable challenge. In Finland, first of all, forests are a key economic sector, and the aim of scaling up the use of wood as a renewable and carbon neutral resource is underpinned by the principle of sustainability, as we've also heard in the video that we've seen earlier. So my question to you would be the following. Can you highlight how in the wood building program in Finland, you have set, which you have set up in Finland, you have managed to actually integrate the protection and the sustainable use of forests? And could you, when doing so, also highlight how you work on scaling up this national example at a European level? So how do you do that, Mr. Hino? Thank you very much, Mr. Buck. And uh, thank you for introducing and setting me also on the stage with the very interesting questions and, uh, and the framework. Um, yeah, I, one thing I have to mention uh, to start with, even though the ice hockey sticks are not anymore made out of wood, but uh, Finland won the world championship in ice hockey last night. So <clears throat> congratulations to Finland. So dear participants all around the world. So I'm Petri Heino. I work at the Ministry of the Environment at the Department of the Built Environment. I'm the director of the Wood Building Program. And as you, of course, may know, Finland's forests represent the country's most significant renewable natural resource. As the demand for natural resources rises in the future, Finland's timber reserves are sure to become an even more important asset. Finland has succeeded to combine all the sustainability uh, criteria, and uh, it is very, economically important we have been import in we have been able to increase the the forestry growing stock and all the time also the harvested uh, uh, cubic meters but of course there is a lot and there is a need to do better forestry practices have to be further developed when societies need a change there is a growing need for new products for the construction sector. There is a growing need to put more focus on biodiversity issues. 
but as a kind of a guiding target for the whole Finland and the development is that we have set the target for carbon neutrality by 2035. There are multifaceted reasons to promote the use of wood in construction, even though we use it a lot in Finland. As we use estimated 0 0.6 cubic meters of wood, wooden products per capita. We have a long tradition in using it, but there is also need for new development. As our moderator mentioned, there is a growing demand on materials in the world. Estimation of the increased demand and their apparent emissions clearly show that the business as usual is not possible. And also there is a decarbonization development of the, of the other materials such as concrete and steel, but this development is not fast enough. Therefore, we have to change, change the construction sector. Thinking of, uh, yeah, for the construction sector, it should be that the circular economy principles must become the basic requirement for all construction or any kind of material use, usage actually. And the, the use of renewable materials must be maximized. And it was also mentioned that wood has to be used efficiently and wisely. You, you can approve the use of wood when the store, when they, the products store carbon for a long time, longer than earlier. And then that the products can be recycled and as the end util, at the end utilized as the energy source or they substitute more harmful materials. Rich research shows that the highest sub substitution or displacement, displacement factor can be reached in construction or in the fabrics and clo clothing in industry with the newest technologies. Yeah, the, we have a national wood building program which aims to promote the use of wood in, in construction by granting support for research and development and supports municipalities. I, I want to say that these municipalities has a really big role in, in changing the, the construction sector. Uh, the, only the wood building program cannot be effective. We need a wider, wider shoulders. In, from in, in, the, in the ministries and also supported by the politicians. In Finland, the basis is the bioeconomy strategy created 2014 and recently renewed just this year. Energy and climate strategy supported the wood building program by funding. So as a measure to, to one measure to reach the carbon neutrality. Circular economy strategy has has several connections to the wood building strategy or the program, sorry. And then we have a roadmap to low carbon construction that of course naturally supports the use of wood as we are setting the limit values for carbon footprint for new construction. But the construction sector is a difficult sector. It's fixed systems with, for, with high risks and low innovation. It's also very local. The most environmentally efficient way to build and use wood are also local and need a lot of understanding. There is a U European Commission's Green Deal has set uh, yeah, ambitious goals for Europe to become climate neutral for 2050. And I quote one, one of their messages, wood could even play a vital role role and become a key enabler for the transformation towards a carbon neutral industry and climate positive society. This requires joint efforts among member states and stakeholders. To improve and ease that policy development in European countries, we do a joint effort as required by the Commission. A wood policy platform initiative is being created by by Finland and Austria. An open collaborative political platform can facilitate and smoothen cooperation among important decision makers by connecting them 
via various means. The overall subject objective of such a platform could be to showcase the added value of wood and wood-based materials towards the carbon neutral economy. Su summary, basic requirement basic requirements for building the carbon neutral future with wood. Of course, sustainable forestry, circular economy principles pushed through the whole economy, holistic development of the built environment, meaning regulatory environment, supply of wooden solutions, demand of wood, education sector and know-how, and communication to the great public. Thank you for your attention so far. I'm looking forward to the to the discussion. Kiitos. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hino, for uh, reminding us that in the construction sector, indeed, business as usual is not really an option if we uh, aspire to meet, you know, environmental goals and objectives and also build more resilient economies. And thank you for sharing this very interesting example from Finland, as well as the initiative by Finland and Austria to scale up that effort at a European level. So once more, many thanks, Mr. Petri and Mr. Hino. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now again change continents and move to Chile. Um, and we now wanna look actually also at two uh, more building blocks and how they can mutually reinforce each other, namely protection and restoration. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Ms. Gabriela, Gabriela Violeta Soto Nilo. Uh, Gabriela is trained as a veterinarian with a specialization in sustainability, climate change and natural resources. Uh, Gabriela has worked in the academic area, private and public in the, in the past nine years, and she currently heads the Department for Climate Change and Environmental Services at the National Forestry Corporation, CONAF, in Chile. So a warm welcome, Gabriela. And Gabriela, my question to you would be the following one. Um, as also research strongly suggests the most immediate and greatest benefit for both carbon and biodiversity are likely to come from actions that reduce deforestation and forest degradation. And although, as we have heard earlier, the rate of deforestation has been declining, uh, still 10 million hectares per year have been lost between the years 2015 and 2020. Tell 10 million hectares per year, that's a lot. Ecosystem payments are widely used as a system to incentivize farmers and foresters to adopt more sustainable land use practices. And that is what actually brings us to Chile, because in Chile, you have put in place an ecosystem payment for carbon farming. Can I ask you to tell us more about how this uh, ecosystem payment for carbon farming system allows, makes it possible to mutually reinforce protection and restoration of forest landscapes? The floor is yours, Gabriela. Thank you. Hello to everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Well, um, in Chile, one of the ways that we uh, to been working to highlight the importance of the forest was to include it in specifically in our NDC. I think that is a, a really a really a really important key that we are we're use, that we are using. As you know, the NDC commitments are mandatory, so we have to implement a specific action to achieve the different goals. Uh, we have four um, principal uh, goals, one related to afforestation and recovery. For more than, uh, we have to, for afforestation and recovery, 200,000 hectares, uh, with, with that at least uh, 100,000 with permanent forest uh, cover, which is very important because it's, it's important to maintain and to keep uh, the actions that we are developing on, on the floor. Uh, also, we have an a, a important commitment uh, related to sustainable management of that native forest. Uh, this is important because it's not only because we can't uh, forbid the use of the forest for sure. And we have, and if we are managing, managing, we have to um, try to do it in a sustainable way. And for that reason, it's very important. We, we can provide, we, it's, there are a lot of persons, as we saw uh, in the video at the beginning, that live on the forest, inside of the forest. And uh, for that reason, we have to encourage, uh, at the end, uh, uh, sustainable management for it. Uh, in this case, we have a law related to uh, sustainable management, which I think is a very important uh, topic. We can discuss later. 
Uh, also, uh, we have a, a goal related to emission reduction, uh, implement and promote uh, actions to reduce emission uh, from the forestry sector related to degradation and deforestation of our native forest. Uh, this is very important, and I think in Chile is different than in, in the other countries. We don't have that uh, huge problem with deforestation, but we have a problem uh, with degradation of the forest. That is one main difference that we have. And for the four uh, goal that we have is, is a restoration at landscape level. It's a national landscape uh, restoration plan, which considered to incorporate uh, at least one million of hectares of land caves of la landscape, sorry, in a restoration process for 2013. And here I want to uh, highlight that we are working uh, with other um, ministry of the government. John said that it's difficult and it's, it's a barrier, uh, the, the, the issue that we are not working the coordination between the different agents of the government. And here uh, we have um, an example that we are trying to do it. It is not easy because, uh, you know, it is not easy to work together, but we are uh, working in that path. Yes or yes. Uh, also, I want to uh, tell you about uh, the result based payment that we had already with Red Plus. Uh, for us, it's a big step. We uh, have a national red strategy uh, led by CONAF. We are the focal point of, of, of Red Plus in the country. And we are already uh, move forward to the third phase of Red. Uh, we have the partner in crime, uh, La FAO. We are working with FAO uh, as an agency. And uh, we have results from the GCF. We are, we are trying to uh, execute actions on the territory from afforestation, restoration, action to prevent forest fires, uh, sustainable management too. And also education, environmental education, because that is one of the key uh, to keep the initiatives going on. Also, as you know, RED has a different approach. We have a lot of, um, of different uh, necessities to, to achieve. Uh, for example, we have to work with indigenous people. We have to include a gender approach uh, with all the safeguards that we have. And also we have to uh, try to, to work with monitoring, reporting and verification. It is really important if, you, if we uh, develop some action on the territory, monitoring and verify if it's working or not. That is uh, a key issue in, in Red Plus. It is not easy because it's different than the, the, the vision that we had for many years. Let's go to the territory and just afforestate or restoration without asking to the community. That is really important for Red. That is the key uh, that we think that we're gonna have um, the sustainability, at least, of the activities that we are trying to, to execute on the, on the, on the territory. Uh, as economic recovery for COVID, for COVID we have to uh, implement um, an, a plan of a recovery plan. Uh, uh, with activities also sustainable management and afforestation and reforestation that is, is this is a big step it's been like really many years that we didn't have that amount of action on the territory uh, and we are very very proud of that uh, ECONAF is leading that too and also we have different uh, proposals to change some topics of our natural na native forest law uh, to improve it and also we are working to in a new law uh, related to a uh, recovery and uh, recovery of forest fires and afforestation. Uh, we don't have uh, actually uh, the instrument now to uh, push or, or, or try that the person that uh, the lawn, lawn owners uh, work actually in forestation, in afforestation, sorry. And with this instrument, we uh, hope to increase it uh, in a huge, way. Regarding to the tax that we're talking about, that you were talking about, about the tax legislation, actually we had a modification in one in the um, uh, green taxes with new criteria of the uh, GHG that are, uh, are involved there, but also we have a uh, possibility to offsetting, but it's a huge step because uh, all or part of the emission tax set may be offset through the implementation of projects to reduce the emissions uh, of the same pollutants. 
uh, in the in our territory have to be uh, in the country and not, not it cannot be an investment uh, in other countries that is very impor important it had principal principles uh, it have to be additional for sure verifiable permanent uh, clear baseline uh, we have to take uh, care about the safeguard against the impact that we had and also if this is one of the more important we have to avoid double accounting that is a really, really important thing that we have to achieve. In this uh, scenario, um, nature-based solution project are big, are big, uh, big has a big important, uh, and we are working on that now. Uh, we have to clarify some methodologies, for example, the game rule for nesting, uh, to try to improve the, the private sector to develop this uh, kind of project, uh, and working together with them. It is really important to try to work with the private sector. Uh, it's a main issue. Our NDC says our climate change law also uh, is pushing that in that way. If otherwise we're not we're not we're not gonna uh, reach our goals uh, that we have with the convention and on all this and all the, the activities that we are working. That's for me. Thank you so much, Gabriela, for sharing with us this, these very interesting examples of how in Chile you integrate the different policies, the forest, the climate, the fiscal policies. And I found it particularly impressive that you even uh, developed a formal plan of which actually uh, pays attention to forests uh, in the COVID recovery. So that is uh, quite special, I would say. So muchas gracias. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we again change continents and we move on to Africa. And I'm very happy that today we are joined by the 2022 Bangari Matai Forest Champion, Ms. Cecil Ndebet. Um, Cecil uh, is, has been working all her life, basically, on strengthening the forestry community from a grassroots level, starting with the most disempowered. Uh, Cecil is an agronomist and social forester from Cameroon who has fought for decades to defend and restore forests and empower rural and indigenous women across Western and Central Africa. Cecil leads the African Women's Network for Community Management of Forests, the REFACOF, an advocacy platform focusing on Africa's women's tenor rights in land and forest reforms, operating in no less than 20 countries and Cecil is also an advisory board member of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And uh, those of us who were fortunate to join the World Forestry Congress will recall her truly impressive uh, recollection of her first meeting with the late Vangari Matai and how this has inspired her work. Cecil, first of all, uh, once again, sincerest congratulations on having been uh, awarded the 2022 Vangari Matai Forest Champion award of the CPF. And here, Cecil, comes my question to you. Smallholders, local communities, and indigenous peoples own or manage at least 4.35 billion hectares of forest and farmland, which is nearly half of the world's forests and farm landscapes. Uh, their involvement in forest pathways is therefore, needless to say, essential for scaling up the implementation of these three pathways. Cecil, your work has particularly focused on strengthening the role of women, securing tenant rights, and the mobilization of financial resources. Can you illustrate for us why such interventions are truly essential for restoring and protecting forests and fragile ecosystems? Cecil, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alexander. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, webinar, and I hope that uh, we'll take something from it to move forward. Yes, let me say that it's extremely important to work and to involve women and local communities in general, if we really want to recover, if we are aiming at the green recovery, it's important, and what, why? Is it important? Because first of all, when we take back in Africa, as you were now working, talking about African continent, women constitute more than half of the population in most of the African countries. And I think this is a key uh, element that could, you cannot work with that with only half of, uh, half percent, uh, half of the population. 
we have to work with everybody. When we, we move to the crop production for food, and you will realize that they produce not less than 70% of food crops. This is also a key element for us that should show the importance of involving them and putting them at the center. And as you said, smallholders are caring for almost half of world forest and farmland. And, and I think we, we cannot say we, we, are, we are aiming at green recovery. We are aiming at sustainable management of our resources. We are aiming at restoring the ecosystem and ignoring, and we can we, we ignore that. And when we move to now, and we'll see that um, in, within that, that environment, we have non tiba forest products, and women are leading the non tiba forest product exploitation, at least at the very local uh, starting point of the value chain. And the, 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 the challenge is also to take them all through the, the, the value chain so that they can improve the income they can uh, they are generating from that they are very much engaged in agroforestry system this is shown everywhere of course we we lack statistic in this but the initiative in many countries show that rural population rural women are leading agroforestry activities not less than 60 percent in most of the countries at least in the sub-saharan african countries and um, of course, also, they are key actors, as is shown in biodiversity conservation. So when, when we put all this together and you realize that, if I refer to the state uh, of the world forest 2022, where they are, it reveals that small producers receive less than 1.5% of climate finance in, in 2019, and the situation does not appear to have improved since 2019. And when we take 1.5% uh, of, of climate finance and we put it among the, and we share it among the small producers, if we consider that within these uh, small producers, we have at least 60% of well, fifth, or let's say, let's be humble enough and say about 50% of women, we, 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 I'm not sure that Within uh, this, uh, from this one percent, one point five percent of climate finance, women can access even five percent from that. So we, we we see the challenges that are facing uh, this group of this target group, and that need to be focused on, and that play and those who play key roles in all what we are saying about green recovery, about sustainable management of, of our resources, about restoring our ecosystem. Uh, the, the FAO, uh, FAO uh, study also recognized and showed that if, if for example, if we increase uh, women, uh, the, 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 if, if women could increase the agricultural yield by 20 to 30 percent, if they have the same access as men to uh, productive resources. So we, we have now to see, we have the climate finance, which is there to support this effort of green recovery, but if the farmers, the, the smallholders who are caring for more than half of our world forest are receiving only 1.7%, within, within which I'm not sure women can even access 5%. And when we recall that uh, women can only own or so far 1-3% of the traditional land in most of our countries, we have to understand that it is key to bring these challenges on the table and see how we can change the, 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 uh, all these, uh, how can I say it, if we want to, we have to change all this and, and make all what we can to improve the situation. We, are, we have to change these uh, parameters. We have to change all this if not, it will be difficult for us to, to achieve this um, uh, sustainable growth and uh, sustainable development we are aiming at. 
and funding mobilization is 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 um, a key is a key challenges we have to think of uh, if we really put emphasis and we recognize the key role smallholders farmers are doing and most of uh, among them rural women we have to think of how to improve the security for tenure uh, we are talking about agroforestry they are leading agroforestry in our continent women and if they do we have insecure tenure how can we move? Um, I'm, I'm also remembering what Johanna was sharing earlier. It's extremely important that the schemes like agroforestry be supported because this is almost what local communities have, have uh, decided to go for. And for that, we need tenure security for the women who are playing key roles in this. So, uh, the, the experience I may, I may share is that one, and the importance of having smallholder farmers, women on the table of decision-making, on the table of planning, on the table of funding mobilization is a must. If really a must, if we are serious about the three pillars that have, you know, we have to produce, we have to protect, to restore, and to use. If they are excluded, all that will not be possible. Thank you so far. Thank you so much, Cecile. Merci bien. Um, as you said, uh, if we want to recover economically and environmentally, we need to involve the women and the smallholder land managers. So I think that is really a very strong message that resonates very much. Um, and um, so thank you, Cecile, uh, for sharing with us and experiences. And thank you again, um, also for, uh, once more for having uh, been the, become the this year's Angari Matai Forest Champion and for really, you know, not championing the cause of women in rural areas and in forest and forestry. Uh, so colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we are running a little bit behind schedule, but we still do have a few minutes uh, left. Uh, for questions to the panelists. So once more, I would like to encourage you to uh, post your questions in the Q&A box so that we can pass them on to our panelists so that they can be answered by them. And actually, I can already see one question and that question actually goes to Johan. So Johan, the question is for you. And the question is how indigenous peoples have been included in your agroforestry efforts, efforts in Laos. So, Johan, could I ask you to elaborate? And that's also actually a nice connector to what uh, Cecile has, on, has just mentioned. Could I ask you to, to elaborate a little bit on how you work with uh, the indigenous peoples in Laos? Yeah, thank you for, the, for that question. And for us, it's, it's more that working with the, with the local people, no, no matter what, 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 what how say, uh, different groups of people or so on in the area but it's about finding a model to cooperate with the people that are either using the land today or are located close to the land so so very often when we when we come to an area where where we would like to to work we collaborate with several different villages because they often overlap in 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 how they use land and so on so i would say a very collaborative model to, to try to engage uh, um, uh, different villages and, and all the stakeholders around the, the area where we would like to, to plant. Yeah, thank you very much, Johan. And, and I think that, that that aspect of uh, inclusiveness of really including, you know, the, the whole range of stakeholders is something that is relevant in the context of all the various examples that we have heard. Um, and, and actually, um, I would now want to ask the panel, having heard all these excellent examples, it seems to me that what is needed really is to scale them up uh, in view of making an impact on a more global scale. So having now also just heard Johan, what he told us about Laos and so on, uh, I would invite our panelists to, to let us know how you believe we could really uh, scale up these efforts really more at the global level so that we can even have a, a larger impact uh, as a whole. So who would like to, uh, to elaborate a little bit on that, uh, on that question of scaling up? Can I? Yes, yes, please, yes, uh, yes, please. 
Yeah, thank you. I think that scaling up is extremely important. Uh, we have very uh, good initiatives that are going on here and there, but uh, they are very, as we are saying, small initiatives. But when we scale them up, I'm, I'm taking an example of, of the African Women's Network, what we are trying to do. We started, when we started restoration process, we had we had nearly like 100 hectares to restore. We always very bad areas eh, that we were allocated, but we could succeed. But today we have succeeded to uh, bring in some government to allocate land to women, even if they are not that good uh, piece of land, but at least the secure location of land. And you can find now in few of our countries, in some of our countries, in Cote d'Ivoire, in, in Congo, uh, uh, DRC, in Cameroon, in Liberia, in Togo, women having uh, uh, much land even if they are degraded, they are degraded, but they, with the agroforestry system that they are putting in place, they are generating considerable uh, um, income from agricultural crops and planting trees in the same time. So I think it's only like supporting what is going on, sharing what is going on, the successes, and now putting uh, the, all our effort to increase what is what is being done. For example, for for the for the decade we have we have we are uh, aiming at planting twenty million trees. So far, we are around three or four million altogether. When I, I see it, but scaling to twenty million, that's also scaling up of what is going on, and that with great success because what we are doing can be shared, can be seen, and the impact positive impact is there for the environment, for the economics. And I think it's just making in, uh, taking into account that we have uh, some networks, some NGOs, some platform that are working. We have some initiatives like FFF that have shown supporting small homeholder farmers. Let invest in those so that we can scale up what has succeeded and progressively, I think we can get there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Cecile. I think you have given us two key terms, networking and platforms. And I sense, Gabriela, you also were uh, actually uh, tempted to say something. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Please, I think to, um, to escalate in, in, in at least uh, to have the sustainability of all the projects is basic to involve the communities that are related and depend on the forest from the beginning. It is not, we planify a design and then they come. We have to planify, design and implement, execute together with them. And the, the, the possibility to providing uh, sustainability and scaling uh, with this approach, I think uh, is huge. Additionally, in Chile, we have an important gap related to the possession of the land, the land ownership. Uh, the majority of the land, I don't know if in the other countries is the same, uh, are uh, for men. The 80% of the, the, the land that we can use for foresting and restoration uh, are uh, uh, owner, but men. And I think that is a huge gap. We are trying to work um, in that uh, with the modification, for example, of our law, trying to uh, do not for some of the activities that we can we can uh, pay as a state to don't um, to don't need the the possession of the land, and that way we can uh, also include women uh, in the different uh, activities that we are working out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriela. And actually, this is also something that I can uh, mention as a side note. Uh, also is uh, an important research area in my own organization, really, you know, how to, to strengthen the role of women also in, first, in terms of forest ownership, forest management, and, and so on, because as you mentioned, there continue to be significant imbalances. Um, uh, dear panelists, we do have a one uh, time for one very short uh, intervention before we move on to the closing segment. So I wonder if one of the other panelists or perhaps our setting the scene speaker 
would like to make just one very brief uh, intervention also. Uh, yes, yes, thank you, Alexander. Yeah, I, I would just like to um, support everything that, that Cecile in particular has, has been saying. I think the, the, key, the key to uh, proper valuation of forests and ensuring that they can be sustainably managed and restored, in fact, depends on basically getting out of the way of initiatives such as those that Cecile described. Making, you know, enabling local communities uh, by, by focusing on secure land tenure, um, facilitating use of, of traditional knowledge, and uh, in many other in many other areas that, that um, but, but I think the key is to focus on the needs and aspirations of, of local communities who are the stewards of the land, who are most concerned about the long-term value of forests. So that'd be my addition. Thank you so much, Sean. Perfect. Uh, many, many thanks. So uh, a big thank you really to everybody, to all our speakers and panelists uh, and our audience for today's uh, discussion, which I personally really found very stimulating. And uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to turn to Ms. Mary Atala, who is the coordinator of, Nature for Climate, of the Nature for Climate branch at the United Nations Environment Programme. And I would like to invite her to provide her concluding reflections on how we can build forward by investing into forest-based solutions. And thank you so much, Ms. Atala, for having agreed to be part of this webinar today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alexander. And first, please allow me to thank our esteemed panelists. It was a very diverse and very interesting perspectives that we heard from very different sectors. And, uh, and backgrounds and continents. We, we took a flight across the world. It was fantastic. Thank you very much. In, in closing, I would like to reflect a little bit on what has been said and what we have learned over several years. For example, in the red world, we have been, it's been approved or we started the negotiations on red in Bali in 2008. So we have a little bit of, uh, time behind us, as uh, um, Maria Elena mentioned in her opening, in her opening remarks. Uh, first, I would like to start by saying that anything we lose, we cannot recover, not in the same state. So um, that is, is, I think, a fundamental, um, a, a fundamental point to take into account when we look at the first pathway is that investing in conservation and the preservation of forests is of utmost importance, because even though we may try, uh, we are very unlikely to restore forests in the same functional way that, um, that they were and in the same richness that they were in. Second is that we have some very, very promising prospects in terms of the carbon market, um, we have been seeing a lot of um, net zero commitments coming up from the private sector, from governments, from other entities, uh, which are an opportunity for forests in that they do provide that, that offset part of the net zero. However, I also think that we need to be very careful in making sure that these net zero commitments are made with integrity that they place mitigation first before offset and making sure that indigenous peoples and local communities are involved and engaged in anything that entails offset or nature-based solutions because we do want to avoid land grabbing and we do want to make sure that um, any, um, any, any carbon finance is essentially uh, reaching local communities. Third is that, I think this is something that Johan was mentioning, is that carbon financing alone will not be sufficient. What we need is blended finance in a blended landscape. And I think Gabriela also mentioned this from the experience in Chile, um, is that we, we need to blend multiple sources of funds in order to achieve what we want to achieve in terms of um, a forest conservation, management, and uh, restoration. Uh, third is that um, we cannot, uh, ecosystem restoration 
And you can see my background is the UN decade of, on ecosystem restoration. Ecosystem restoration cannot be equated to, to tree planting. We now know uh, that uh, we have the 10 principles of ecosystem restoration that have been adopted. They are all encompassing uh, principles. And it's really critical that we don't confuse or simplify, oversimplify or reduce ecosystem restoration to tree planting. Why? Because we know by experience that sustainable use is not straightforward. We now know that monoculture are maybe very efficient uh, from a provisioning point of view, from a timber provisioning point of view, but are also extremely vulnerable from uh, a point of view of fires, a point of view of diseases, and a point of view of the other ecosystem uh, services that um, forests uh, provide. Hence, you know, reaffirming the three pathways that uh, have been uh, that have been put forward as uh, solutions. There was a very important question on scaling up, and scaling up is not going to be possible without finance. Um, UNEP has issued the Finance for Nature report in 2020, in which we say that we need to triple finance for nature by 2030 in order to achieve our results. If anything, what the COVID crisis has taught us is that governments, private sector um, philanthropies are very much able to put out the funding that is needed when there is a crisis. And currently, environment is a crisis. We need to stop thinking that this is something that we can address in 2030. This isn't something that we should have addressed in 1972 when the Stockholm Convention um, uh, uh, started. Um, and maybe uh, on this issue of financing, uh, what the panel has shown us as well is that we as foresters or as fans of forests, um, may have to accept that financing for forests may not go to forests. Financing for forests may go to the agriculture sector. If only we see how much uh, agriculture is one of the main drivers of deforestation, how much agriculture subsidies are essentially leading to deforestation, we may have to accept that financing for forests will go to other sectors than forests. And here the intersectoral coordination that Gabriella has been mentioning means also that there may be power asymmetries among ministries, among institutions, among sectors that will need to be addressed. And we will have to be very cognizant of those and address them uh, straightforward. And lastly, maybe on the upscaling again, a message to the global financing community is that so far we have defragmented financing. Under my branch, I have the red team that deals with mitigation. I have the climate adaptation team and I have the decade. And if you look at what they are doing, it's pretty much the same, except that all of them have different sources of funds that they need to justify with different indicators. What this means is that we are fragmenting financing and probably everyone operating at the country level knows that this means different projects for different sources of funds with different project management units, different reporting cycles, different teams, and that leads to fragmentation on the ground. And it leads to the capacity constraints that we often um, mention as one of the difficulties in addressing challenges that we have. So um, taking into account the fact that we've seen important uh, commitments, everyone has called to financing small scale, small scale producers. We know that we have less than 2% of global climate finance reaching small, fi uh, small farmers and IPLCs and developing countries. This needs to increase. And we've also seen that with the UN Food Summit, we've got more than 140 countries that have pledged uh, through the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use to eliminate forest loss by 2030. We need the money to be able to do that. An additional 19 billion 
needs to be allocated, has been promised, but still needs to be allocated in order to turn these promises into action. And this is, I think, where we need to focus um, our attention, our advocacy, and our efforts to demonstrate that these resources can actually lead to impacts um, on the ground. Thank you very much, Alexander. And thanks again for a fantastic panel. Yes, thank you again, Mary, for first of all, distilling so precisely again the main points that have been made throughout this whole webinar. I couldn't have summarized this in any better way, but importantly also for adding this very important aspect of finance, international finance, to the picture, which is really also a very essential element of this whole discussion. So thank you again very much. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, we have now uh, approached the end of today's event. I apologize, we have gone slightly over time. I hope that we have all been inspired by the really nice and excellent examples we have heard uh, today and also by the good atmosphere. Let us all hope that this will spill over both the substance and the atmosphere into the, uh, the discussions at the Stockholm West 50 event that is about to start um, and will be held in the coming days. And importantly, also uh, let us try a, a combined effort to really also carry these messages into other global fora that we'll meet again in the coming weeks and months, such as the high level political forum of the United Nations, the FAS Committee on Forestry, and importantly also the UNFCCC COP27 in Egypt later in the year. I think really it is important that we carry these messages uh, to all these different fora since as we have learned really we need also uh, to make these sectors work much better together and to achieve more coherent and consistent, you know, commitments and policies around the globe. And importantly, let us all make an effort to scale up all these ex examples and experiences from the countries through networking, through communication, through sharing, and so on. So thanks again uh, uh, for joining us today and also for uh, raising important questions. And I wish all of you a very nice rest of your day. Uh, good afternoon, maybe still good morning in some parts of the world, good night in others, and hope to see you soon again, virtually or preferably even in person in the near future. Thank you very much. Goodbye.